Toyota's guiding principles have laid the foundation for us to become a top 10 company for diversity. Through our investment in organizations that empower the black community, we are taking a stand against racial injustice and celebrating the culture and achievements of black Americans. Hello, I'm Eddie Bernice Johnson, chair of the Science, Space and Technology Committee. And I wanna thank you for joining today's Brain Trust discussion. I'm pleased to be joined by esteemed speakers to discuss the critical need to attract and retain African-American students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics studies, commonly known as STEM. As the nations reckon, reckon with the reality of systemic racism in our society, it is fitting for us to come together to examine the long-standing racial inequities in STEM. While we have come a long way from segregation, quotas, and the other legal barriers to full participation of African Americans in STEM enterprises, the legacy of our past lives on. Despite decades of investments and activities to attract African American students in STEM fields, retention of these talented young men and women remain a significant hurdle. A 2019 analysis by the National Center for Education Statistics found that Black STEM college student majors end up changing their majors at higher rates than their white peers. The data also show that the Black STEM majors leave their universities without earning a degree, twice the rate of white STEM majors. According to the National Science Foundation, Black students earn only 4% of the bachelor's degrees in engineering, mathematics, and physical sciences. In some fields, there's been a decline in recent years. According to the recent diversity reports, Black workers make up only 3.3% of Microsoft employees in technical roles. Similarly, at Google, it is 2.4%. And even more sobering, at Facebook, just 1.5%. Now, let me be clear. I'm not trying to pick on these companies. However, I'm simply trying to illustrate that this is recurring all over the nation. And it's a recurring a problem across the entire tech industry. And unfortunately, it does not stop here. The medical workforce that we're relying on, on this fight, even in this global pandemic, is also rife with inequities. Less than 7% of the medical students and less than 3% of practicing physicians are Black. While Black women are making modest gains in representation among medical students, the number of Black men in medical school has decreased. This lack of diversity has amplified long-standing disparities for African-Americans that the COVID-19 pandemic has made impossible to ignore any longer. The lack of diversity in STEM also means that Black students are missing out on STEM careers that are not only engaging and rewarding, but come with higher salaries and job security compared to non-STEM careers. Therein, we continue to see the wealth gap in America persist. This lack of diversity is a health professions. Right now, when we need them most, it reduces the diversity and innovation, culturally competent ideas and creative solutions for our most pressing challenges, including the pandemic. And finally, this lack of diversity has created a crisis in our nation's STEM talent pipeline that can be solved only by addressing head-on factors that have kept or pushed out so many people so long. So let's clear this up right now. This is not about the fact that minorities are not interested in STEM careers. National studies indicate that black students declare STEM majors at comparable rates to white students. I must also indicate here that this dilemma is not about talent, capability, nor determination. Subtle but cumulative acts of discrimination, hostility, 
and implicit biases, stand structural racism, continue to push African-American students out of STEM studies and careers. A recent study by the American Institute of Physics investigate the causes of persistent and underrepresentation of African-Americans in physics and astronomy. Results of that study found that there were two factors critical for persistence in these fields are, one, a sense of belonging, and two, students perceiving themselves as being recognized by others as future physicists or astronomers. While everything I said thus far are the collective challenges we face, there is a modem of hope. The good news is that HBCUs have charted a course of how to provide the necessary support to retain and graduate Black STEM students. HBCUs play an outsized role in educating African-American STEM graduates. While HBCUs make only 3% of the nation's colleges and university. HBCUs graduate 32% of the American, African-American students earning bachelor's degrees in the physical sciences, 29% in mathematics and 27% in biological sciences. And 25% of African-Americans with STEM PhDs earn their bachelor's degrees at HBCUs. This is promising. However, we must do more to scale up the successful approaches pioneered at HBCUs. For example, we must also expand the capacity within HBCUs by providing high quality STEM education and research experience to students. Further, we must push universities and employers that have struggled to diversify their student body and workforce and we must challenge them to sincerely evaluate their policies and workplace culture that really continue to impede the retention and advancement of African-Americans and other minority groups. The Science, Space and Technology Committee, which I chair, has advanced a number of bills to address diversity and inclusion in STEM studies and careers. Last year, we passed in the House the STEM Opportunities Act and the Minority Servants Institution STEM at Achievement Act. We need to get action on these bills in the Senate. The STEM Activities Act supports research and programs to promote diversity and inclusion in academic studies and research careers across all types of institutions. The Minority Serving STEM Achievement Act will help build research capacity and includes other efforts to support the historically black colleges and universities and other minority serving institutions, which we know play an outsized role in graduating African American students with STEM degrees. My recent amendment to the House Commerce, Justice, Science and Appropriations Bill requires national academies to study, to examine the impact of systemic racism in careers of African-American students and researchers and consequences of these inequities for our research enterprise. To begin to solve this problem, we must dispel the illusion that STEM is entirely merit-based and free from racism, the plagues of the rest of the society. We must do the hard work to lower the barriers for Black students and boldly imagine future possibilities for STEM education. I look forward to the presentations from today's outstanding speakers and a fruitful discussion about how we move forward on this important issue. As I close my statement, uh, we want you to know that within the Congressional Black Caucus, we cannot achieve without strategic partners. And so our major internal stakeholder or holder for this program is the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And on behalf of the CBC and the CBC Foundation, we offer our special thanks to our external stakeholders, especially those corporations who generously provide 
financial and in-kind support to make this annual legislative conference possible. I'm pleased to announce that our annual science and technology brain trust has two major sponsors, Conoco Phillips and our title sponsor, Toyota. We will now hear word from Toyota's North American Group Vice President, Chief Social Innovation Officer, who is also President of Toyota Motor Manufacturing, Mississippi, Mr. Sean Subs. Hello and good afternoon. I am Sean Suggs, Group Vice President and Chief Social Innovation Officer for Toyota Motor North America and Plant President of Toyota Mississippi, where we proudly produce the world's best-selling car, the Toyota Corolla. I recently took the reins from Al Smith, who many of you may know as he serves on the board of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And I know I've got big shoes to fill, but we both share a passion for investing in our youth and building opportunities and access. And I am honored to be here today on behalf of Toyota team members, dealers, suppliers, and strategic partners across the U.S. Supporting Brain Trust for the Congressional Black Caucus 2020 Annual Legislative Conference. Toyota is grateful and proud to have sponsored this conference for more than 15 years and to join Chairwoman Eddie Bernice Johnson today to discuss the importance of STEM education and how we prepare and motivate and inspire African American students for careers of today and tomorrow. This is critical to achieving a level playing field. In Mississippi, I serve on the State Board of Education and most recently have been focused on closing the digital divide across the state. As many of you know, COVID has exposed many inequalities in our nation. And as a leader in corporate America, I'm prepared to step up and advocate for change. That begins at home in my own backyard. On the plant for, floor a few months ago, we chose to pause production for eight minutes and 46 seconds to allow our team members to reflect and begin a meaningful process that allows our team members to be heard and understood. With that pause, it was symbolic. The process is designed to create meaningful change and now we are focused on action. That includes addressing long-standing issues like the Mississippi state flag where I was proud to stand together with business community leaders to retire it. And doubling down on education and workforce initiatives like the Toyota Technical Training Program, the Toyota T10 Program was recently expanded in the country, including Northern Texas at Collins College Technical Campus. This is so important because we know the skills gap is not going away fast. This is a passion we share with Congressman Johnson, who represents the 30th Congressional District of Texas and Dallas County. As you know, as you may know, Toyota's headquarters is in Plano, Texas, a short 30 miles away, which in the state the size of Texas makes us next door neighbors. Congresswoman Johnson is a true trailblazer, the first black woman ever elected to public office in Dallas the first woman in Texas history to lead a major te Texas House committee, the first African-American woman to serve as a regional director for the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the first African-American woman to chair the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Like the Congresswoman, Toyota recognized that true inclusion, economic environment requires education. As Toyota transitions to a mobility company, we continue to support initiatives like Brain Trust to ensure a true mobile society where all people can move, explore, and grow to their full potential. I wanna thank all of you for being here today and allowing me to share a few words. We are grateful for this partnership. We appreciate the work you do and value the impact that you have on our communities across the nation. 
We look forward to continuing our work together for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. And now we'll go directly to our panelists. Our first presenter will be Dr. Victor McCrary, who is Vice President for Research and Graduate Programs at the University of District of Columbia. He is the former president of the National Organization for Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers and a fellow of the American Chemical Society. Dr. McCary was appointed by President Barack Obama to the National Science Board, where he currently serves as the vice chair, which oversees the National Science Foundation in October of 2016. Dr. McCrary. Thank you, uh, Congressman Johnson. I want to thank the 2020 Annual Legislative Conference. I want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for this opportunity. Um, you talked about a lot of topics that are very resonate with me in terms of how are we producing our talent, particularly our brown and black talent, to address the global competition that we face in this nation. And that HBCUs are one component of those talent producers. And so I thought for our audience today, I'd tell you a little bit about what the HBCUs are doing and why it's strategically important at this point in time that we consider investment in those institutions as one of the many pipelines that we have in order to create a domestic diverse STEM talent workforce. So I'm gonna bring up this presentation here that's gonna talk a little bit about um, what we are doing with HBCUs for those who may not know. I just wanted to give you some fast facts about HBCUs. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, they produce they're about 3% of our nation's universities, but they produce at least 30% of the engineering um, degrees at the bachelor level. There's about 300,000 students enrolled uh, in our HBCUs. That's about 10% of the African-American students. These universities have an impact of about $15 billion. There's 101 accredited HBCUs. But besides that, according to the recent report that came out in February of 2019 by the National Academies of Science and Engineering, if you look at MSIs, okay, of which HBCUs are a subset, MSIs at the bachelor's level produce more undergraduate bachelor's in, temp, in STEM than do majority institutions. So HBCUs play an incredible role for our country. I just wanted to show you here, here are the 11 research intensive R2 uh, HBCUs as classified by the Carnegie classification. And of course, the one in orange, I had to show my school, uh, UDC, which is an M2. But I just wanted to show you their research expenditures here and their expenditures and endowments that they get from the National Science Foundation as well as their own personal endowments. And while they pale in comparison to majority schools, which get about over 65 billion in R&D, uh, HBCUs combined get about 485 billion in R&D. But these schools uh, really are contributing to our research landscape. If you look at a school like Morgan State University, Dean DeLoach there, uh, he has the credit and was honored by the National Science Board last year because he has produced more black African-American engineers than any institution in the history of higher education in America. And we also have the ABED accredited engineering schools. As you see, these schools are the 15 engineering HBCU engineering schools that put out a majority of our black engineers. So if you take these schools together, the R2 schools, as well as the M1 schools, ABED accredited schools, you have 22 research intensive HBCUs. And it's really important that our nation make that investment. Um, and I'll tell you why. This is a slide from the National Science Board. So I'm gonna put my National Science Board hat on. As you can see, over the past two decades, the US share of research and development has been decreasing, going down from 37% to 25% in 2017, and that decrease is continuing, okay? And it's a global competition. As you can see, other parts of the world have increased their share of R&D, particularly in the East, Southeast, and South Asia. At the same time, 
if we're going to address this issue, we have these missing millions that we have to go after. And as a member of the National Science Board, we recognize this. If you look at both women, Latinos, and African Americans still underrepresented in STEM, women have done a lot better, but Latinos and Blacks have not reached population parity. We're still stuck at 4% and 6%, respectively. But you know, right now, this is a Sputnik moment. And what do I mean by that? A Sputnik too. When I came along in the late 50s, there was a satellite called Sputnik that orbited the, the Earth. It put the whole US science and engineering community in a frenzy. Oh my God, the Soviets are ahead of us scientifically. What came out after that was the Defense Authorization Education Act, which I was a recipient of the new math. There were books that were poured into the public schools. Labs were equipped. Teachers were uh, retaught to teach math and science. And by the way, I ended up having, having a curiosity in science. I eventually became a chemist and got my bachelor's degree at Catholic University and my PhD in physical chemistry at Howard University under the distinguished of William Jackson and then went on to my professional career. It was because there was this sense of urgency. Well, now this urgency is here again. And as a nation, we have to respond. And in this case, we have this pool of talent that is available. The New York Times came out with an article uh, three years ago called Lost Einsteins. And it talked about this black and brown talent that we have to tap. But not only we have to tap, we have to nurture it. And it's a responsibility for all of us. And when I mean nurture it, we, might, we have a large number of men and women because talent is equally distributed who have the high IQs, who have the affinity for STEM. But if we don't have the support in terms of access to libraries, software, the internet, which has been recently exposed due to COVID-19, then these folks are gonna be pumping gasoline by the time they're 18 years old and we're gonna lose out. And so what is the value proposition that I look at for our nation's HBCUs. I look at it as that we're essential for the national security of the US research enterprise because we are in a race. And this is a copy from the appropriation and uh, Congressman Johnson, you probably may have seen this before from 2018, which talks about the appropriation for the National Science Foundation and the growing concern about China and other competitors are outpacing the United States. Um, the things that we can do going forward as a nation is extremely important if the United States is going to compete in the industries of the future. So what is that, what we have to do? We have to increase those budgets at NSF, NASA, and DOD as they are um, toward the HBCUs. We have to partner with majority institutions and get their PIs to have sabbaticals within the HBCUs. And particularly, We've got to locate research centers where the HBCUs are the lead, particularly in some of these industries of the future, okay? And particularly, maybe focus on those 22 schools right there because those are research intensive because they work in their communities. And then of course, um, as you know, I'm a real fan of working also with our community colleges and technical schools because they provide pathways for people of color to get STEM capable skills. If we can do all these things, the U.S. can be, remain strong and competitive because we did it back in the late 50s and 60s when Sputnik, we did it when we put people on the moon and we can do it now when we face global competition and when we're looking at these new industries that can enrich all of us and make a difference for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McCurry. Now our next presenter will be Dr. Rabowski. He is the president of the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. He was named by President Obama to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Education Excellence for African Americans. And he chaired the National Academies Committee that produced the 2011 report expanding underrepresented minority participation, American science and technology talent at the crossroads. His 2013 TED talk highlights the four pillars of college success in science. A longtime leader, Dr. Hrabowski. 
Thank you very much, Congresswoman. I appreciate it. And thank you to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and the Congressional Black Caucus. I, I begin by thinking about uh, this past two decades and the fact that we've had a number of studies that have been um, actually completed on this topic of underrepresentation. And at the time that I chaired the committee uh, for the report that we did in 2011, 10 years ago, we saw the same statistics that you talked about today, Congresswoman, that we still have this severe underrepresentation of African Americans in these disciplines. In fact, uh, among the national agencies, fewer than 2% of, of the scientists are black today. And that's going to cross those agencies. And so what I'd like to do is to use um, the results of one article which has just been published, published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS. Uh, and it's uh, written by me and author with two other colleagues, um, dated August 4th. So anything I say today can be found in that one article because that article also goes back to talk about other articles my colleagues and I have been writing over a number of years. And let me start by saying uh, that how much I appreciate what you said, Congresswoman, about the need to have different paths for bringing African Americans along from HBCUs to minority serving institutions to other institutions. My campus, UMBC, is a campus that's probably half white, half of color. We have about 2,000 black students out of 14,000. And I am very proud to say I am a graduate of Hampton. And I say that because I learned so much from my experience as a math major at Hampton Institute at the time, now Hampton University. Uh, and so I bring that up to say, it's so important to look at all types of institutions since we know that quite frankly, 70 plus percent of our, of our students, of our black students are not in HBCUs, though HBCUs produce a disproportionately large number, at least a third of the science majors and they produce a large percentage of those who go on to get PhDs. In fact, uh, for a number of years, my campus has been the only non HBCU in the top 10 in producing blacks who get PhDs in science and engineering and what you'll appreciate about that is we are second only to Howard University in the production of Blacks in Science, Natural Sciences and Engineering. And we are the number one producer of Blacks who go on to get MD PhDs. In fact, we have produced more in the history of America than any other university and very proud of what my colleagues and students are doing. Here are the points I want to make today. The article's title was Reimagining Science, Engineering, and Medicine and its Practitioners. And we brought up that point about practitioners because we're looking today at the COVID crisis and we don't see a large number of physicians. We need so many more black physicians. We need more, many more black scientists at the same time that we talk about producing talent for all the disciplines within the STEM areas. And so we, re, we titled, uh, entitled this article Reimagining but still talking about at the crossroads the same way we talked about it 10 years ago. And here's what we would say, that we need to look obviously at pre-K through 12. We need to look at the undergraduate experience, the graduate experience, postdoc and workforce issues, meaning the professor, the faculty, but also research institutions, as well as companies. What are we doing at every level? Now, obviously I can't talk about all those today. In the report, we make recommendations for three for four broad areas. Number one, two things at the K through 12 level. We need more programs that will fund people majoring in teacher education in STEM. STEM majors who will go on to become teachers, very important. Look at our Sherman Scholars Program at UMBC. We're getting very high achieving students. Uh, and the key is to fund them. They need support, financial support to, to, to become these teachers and especially in challenging schools. Uh, and, and we need teachers in math and science for the middle school level. We do not prepare teachers in this country to be math majors if they're going into middle school because it's a K through eight kind of certification. We need them with much stronger backgrounds. And so we also need professional development for teachers to build their math and science schools because they're learning algebra at algebra one and two in middle school today. That's one difference between us and other countries. The, the major low hanging fruit in the report was this and in this article, the undergraduate experience. Congresswoman said it correctly. We have as many black students and Latino students interested in science as we have, as we see with science with, with whites. The problem is that so few actually succeed and graduate with a bachelor's. The study we, we, we found 10 years ago is the same thing today, 
only 20% of blacks who start with a major in science and engineering uh, will actually graduate with a bachelor's. Uh, for whites, it's about 32%. For Asians, it, it's closer to 41%. And so we have what we call a weed out culture, which is a major issue. And so when the Congresswoman talks about what we can do in the kind of legislation, we've done a few things to look at course redesign and the first year and second year work, but we need legislation that gives incentives to institutions to help many more students who are black and other races to make it through the first two years of science, because that will help not only with scientists, but also with students at the medical level. Because to go into medicine, there are certain science courses you have to have in order to do well on that test. So let's connect science and medicine, public health in a different way. Third, we need to look at what's working. Uh, there are certain institutions in our country, uh, whether talking about Xavier in medicine, uh, several Howard Hampton, Spelman, Morehouse and some others that are doing a really fine job in, in uh, North Carolina a and in engineering. We need to look at those camp and my campus and some others, and let's talk about replicating what works. And so one example would be to look at the Howard Hughes replication of our Meyerhoff Scholars Program, leading producer of blacks with MD PhDs in the country. And we just replicated at both Chapel Hill and Penn State. We've got a science article. I talk about it in that article I already mentioned, and it shows that it can work. And we're working with Chan Zuckerberg on doing some things out at Berkeley and San Diego. But the most important point is that it's, it, it's true we need to talk about having more students who are involved in our chapters of, of Novice and of Nesby, but we've got to change the culture in science. We need champions in these departments. My TED talk says you got to have high expectations, but the first point is high expectations of the university, of the faculty. It's not just the students. And the second point, finally, is that we have to think about how to change the culture of our institutions of all types so that we see failure of students as failure of the university. We should not simply say they didn't make it. We've got to change that way of looking at it. The, the, the new book we come out with called The Empowered University says we've got to look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves about what we're not doing to help our students. And so I would say to you at the undergrad level, most important, replication of what Howard Hughes is doing to do that. And then programs like Includes at NSF and Build It at, at, um, at NIH should be expanded broadly. Most important point I can make, students need scholarships and financial support because you cannot study biochemistry or, or biochemical engineering uh, full-time and wait tables 20 hours. You've got to have support to be able to do that. And final point I'll make and I'll stop, at the, at the um, faculty level, we need to talk of course about at the corporate sector and what we're doing with champions there, but at the faculty level, we recommended 10 years ago to have a, a, an, an NSF advanced program of the type we have for women. I chaired and was a PI on the advanced program for women. It works. It works, it builds cohorts, as we talk about in my TED talk. High expectations cohorts, it takes scientists, to produce scientists, and then rigorous evaluation. And we went from 12% women in science and engineering to about a third, about 35%. Not what it should be, but NSF's advanced program has worked well for women. We have been trying to get such a program for people of color, specificity with African Americans and the Latinx populations. Those would be the recommendations. And, and if a new study is going on right now, Congresswoman, they must begin with the recommendations over this past 10 years and say, where are we? What have we done? We don't need to start from scratch. We have so much we know, but what has happened is we've not had a commitment to implement the recommendations coming out of reports from the one that we did to the PCAS report, to the Bayer report. The recommendations are there, which can give you the vast majority of a foundation to make progress. We can do this, but we have to admit there's truly structural racism in STEM. It will take us to change that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinski. Our next presenter will be the Honorable Leslie Miller Frazier, a judge, currently serves as the National STEM Chair for the Links Incorporated and is a member of the MIT Corporation, which is the board of directors and governing body of the Massachusetts Institution of Technology. She received both bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering from MIT and a law degree from University of California at Los Angeles. In 2016, with 21 years of federal service, including 15 years as a member of the Senior Executive Service, Judge Frazier retired from her position as an environmental appeals judge at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the first person of color to serve in that role. 
Prior to joining the federal government, she worked as a research engineer and manager at an aerospace company for nine years where she received a U.S. patent for material she co-invented for spacecraft hydraulic systems. A very achieved presenter, Dr. Frazier. Thank you, Congresswoman Johnson, and thank you to the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I am honored to join this esteemed panel of distinguished speakers. Um, I've been asked to speak about the Lynx Incorporated STEM Ready Signature Program. The Lynx is a 74-year-old international nonprofit volunteer organization comprised of 16,000 professional women of color who volunteer more than 1 million hours annually in programs aimed at the cultural and economic survival of African Americans and other persons of African ancestry. Our Link STEM Ready Signature Program was crafted out of our dedication to ensuring quality STEM education at all grade levels. And so we are focused primarily on getting our kids into the pipeline. I'd like to share my screen with you um, on a, I think it'll be easier to share what's going on from, um, here we go, in the form of a slideshow. So not surprisingly, when we ask our students what they wanna be, they look at what they see. They see athletes, they see models, they see musicians and singers. And so that's what they aspire. And as you noted, there are over just in the tech field, over 4 million jobs unfulfilled compared to about 15,000 professional jobs. Our kids don't see the richest black man in America. We need to make sure they know it's Robert F. Smith, an engineer, um, not Beyonce, nothing wrong with all the others, Oprah, uh, Michael Jordan, but it's Robert F. Smith. Or they don't see Silas and Cooley, who's 26 years old and just signed a contract for seven and a half million dollars for an, a robotics uh, gaming tool that he invented. So our program is really aimed at exposure plus preparation plus fun. We want our kids to look around and say, what can I be? They look around and see people who look like them, including a member of the Lynx in the top right corner. That's an astronaut, Joan Higginbotham. And we wanna prepare them for that reality so that they are excited about engineering and using their own creativity. We get started with debunking the myth that African-Americans don't do STEM. You know, I'd say we invented STEM. We go back to ancient Africa and we look at someone like Imhotep who designed the first pyramid, the first calendar with 12 months and 30 days or Sankore University, an Islamic university in the 1300s that was doing math that is taught at the level done today. These are all available on YouTube. And our program leverages two of our national partnerships, one with the National Society of Black Engineers, or NSBE, a second with the National Wildlife Federation. We have flexibility for our 288 chapters to leverage other partnerships. And we also created a virtual planning guide uh, for our chapters who are now working with students remotely. So not to steal my colleague's thunder who's going to follow me, uh, Dr. Carl Reed, but a component of our partnership is our longstanding relationship with NSBE. Um, we are now going into our sixth year and we focus on the NSBE junior chapters for students in grades three through 12. NSBE offers off the shelf programming for our chapters and anyone else who has a NSBE junior chapter at elementary through high school. Um, these are easily deployable by anyone who wants to work with kids it provides you an opportunity just to work within your chapter or even to compete regionally or nationally at a NSBE annual convention. And here's an example of a NSBE convention. This one is from about a year and a half ago. 11,000 Black folks in STEM, anywhere from young kids to professionals. And just think about that positive peer group we're showing our kids. So in the last four and a half years, our chapters have charted 112 NSBE junior chapters across the United States, including one in Haiti and three in Jamaica. The photo here is one of our chapters in Jamaica. And we are proud to say we have about a third of all of the Nesby Junior chapters worldwide that were active this year. And just within our Nesby Junior chapters, um, our other link chapters are also doing STEM programming elsewhere. 
We're serving just over 1,900 uh, students. And a lot of our students are the students that are typically left out, the ones in urban and rural areas, those that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. 80% of our students are African-American, 14% Latinx, 60% girls. So we're looking at getting more of our girls into STEM. And we've been blessed to have some sponsors with all along our way. So I just wanted to give a shout out of appreciation to them. Our partnership with the National Wildlife Federation allows us to focus on our common issues of climate change, environmental justice, which makes sure that there aren't disproportionate policies aimed at um, our communities. And they have a Gardens for Wildlife program that we can teach students about those other aspects of STEM. A lot of these are taught at HBCUs, botany, environmental science, and so forth. And also their role as stewards of the planet. National Wildlife Federation has a fabulous Gardens for Wildlife program where you can get your garden certified, whether it's at a school, a place of worship, or your own home. And we use the lessons from the butterfly, for example, to teach our students. If you look at a butterfly, it lays an egg that becomes a caterpillar that makes itself into a chrysalis. As the caterpillar matures into a butterfly or metamorphosizes into a butterfly, beats its way out of that cocoon to become a butterfly. So what does the pollinators teach us? It's not your size that determines your role in life. We tell our students, don't let anybody tell you where you come from, who your parents are or aren't. Nobody can predict your role in life. Working hard like that butterfly getting out of that cocoon leads to success. Um, so here's some quick examples of what our chapters have done. Again, looking at exposure plus preparation plus fun. This is our Greater Mobile, Alabama chapter. They took their Nesby Junior students to a news station where they got to see what it takes behind the scenes to produce a news series, as well as transmit that um, abroad and learn about presence, public speaking, et cetera. Our Harbor Lights, Illinois chapter partnered with Abbott Laboratories and taught the students how to extract DNA from strawberries. Our Port City, Texas chapter, which has three Nesby Junior chapters. This one is the um, uh, all girls chapter. And these young ladies won two uh, many competitions at the last two national conventions of Nesby. Morris County, New Jersey has two Nesby Junior chapters. They took their students to an electric power plant so they can learn about engineering and producing electricity that comes to our homes and communities. Oakland County, Michigan chapter has three Nesby Junior chapters, two near Flint outside Detroit and, and one in Jamaica. And they had the students learn about the scientific method by figuring out what products filter dirty water best from cotton balls to gravel to sand, et cetera. This is one of our chapters in uh, Jamaica. Those are 60 students or the whole fourth grade class in our Nesby Junior uh, chapter there. Um, they planted a vegetable garden to make sure that these low income students have a balanced lunch while they're there at school. And then they taught them about healthy eating and how to read a nutrition facts panel and how to do the math there through their little chefs program. In the middle, you see the students eating a carrot salad that they created using carrots grown in their garden. Our Albuquerque, New Mexico chapter used the gardening program to teach an all boys um, group uh, life lessons, money management. Uh, these young men sold, sold their vegetables to the church parishioners after service and they learned about tithing and returning a, pro a, a percentage of their proceeds back into their business as well as um, saving for a rainy day. And they didn't let COVID stop them. This uh, Albuquerque Lynx chapter uh, dropped off plants so that these young men could continue their gardening at home, whether it's in a window box or their backyard garden. Jackson County, Missouri has two Nesby Junior chapters. They taught the students how to take back a vacant lot that had been used by dump for dumping and beautify it. And this is again in the wake of COVID, their social distancing, they planted wildflowers. And just think about the empowerment of these young ladies who now have taken over their neighborhood and restored it. So I wanna leave you in closing with this thought. I told you we are proud to have 112 Nesby Junior chapters, but just imagine if we just had 10 more black organizations, each charter 100 chapters. Maybe it's the Divine Nine and Jack and Jill, maybe it's somebody else. And each of them had 10 to 30 students per chapter. 
just for that 100 chapters per 10 organizations or each 1,000 places of worship, we would have 30 more, 30,000 more of our students exposed to and prepared for STEM. And we can fill that pipeline and change our future for the better. I thank you for this opportunity to join you today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Frazier. And our final speaker before our question and answer period is Dr. Carl Reed. Uh, Dr. Reed is the Executive Director of the National Society of Black Engineers, and he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in material science and engineering from MIT, and a doctorate in education from Harvard University. Prior to joining NSBE six years ago, he oversaw scholarship and workforce development programs, research and HBU, Capacity Building at UNCF, the United Negro College Fund. He is the author of Working Smarter, Not Just Harder, These Sensible Strategies for Succeeding in College and Life. It was your organization that I saw in, in action in Dallas, Texas, that caused me to take the idea to the Western area of the Lynx Incorporated 15 years ago, and then but about 10 years ago, or 11 years ago, we brought it to national, which Dr. Frazier is chairing now. So Dr. Reed, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman uh, Eddie, uh, John, Bernice Johnson, uh, for your pioneering leadership of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, and for your generous invitation for the, to the National Society of Black Engineers to speak uh, as part of the Brain Trust uh, this, uh, today. And I'd like to also add the, the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional um, Black Caucus Foundation for your critical work, especially now. It's good to hear my, my good friend, Judge uh, Leslie Frazier, talk about the work of Nesby. Uh, she sold Nesby, and as, as did you, uh, Congresswoman, for uh, the work that we do. Um, Nesby is one of the largest student-governed associations based in the United States. And while we serve kindergartens to professionals, or what we call K to gray, the Congresswoman asked me to specifically speak about the work we're doing to inspire and equip African American young people to pursue engineering as a noble profession. Uh, in these times of momentous change, a global pandemic that's disproportionately hit black and brown communities around the world, an economic recession that's left millions unemployed, and a racial reckoning that many of us have not seen in our lifetimes, we need the minds of engineers more than ever who are trained to solve complex problems systematically. So this is why it's critically important that we broaden the participation of young people of color so that more of us can be deployed to solve the complex problems that we're facing, not just the technical ones, but also sociological and even political ones, because our approach to solving any problem, as we heard uh, many of the speakers uh, mention, our ability to design and build and test and improve and deploy can just as equally be applied to bridges and tunnels as to dismantling racism and increasing equity in schools, the workplace, in our communities across the country. And many of our members have, uh, have, have launched efforts to do that. So what I'd like to do is share with you, uh, just introduce you to, to Nesby and the organization and some of the work um, that, that uh, and, and sort of build on the presentation that, that, that uh, Judge Fraser just uh, spoke about so, so eloquently about our organization. So we talk about our why. Um, Simon Sinek says, inspired organizations, inspired leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King are very clear about their why. Not just the what, but their why. And Nesby's why is unlocking potential, cultivating confidence, and changing lives. We like to talk about that uh, much more broadly than just our mission itself, because that really undergirds everything that we do, unlocking potential, cultivating confidence, and changing lives. We were founded by six students from the South of Chicago in 1975. They had formed the idea of Black Engineering University and put out a call to 288 colleges and universities asking them to send their Black students to Purdue in, in uh, the spring of 1975 because Purdue had turned around a 80% of dropout rate or attrition rate for Black students in 1971 to a 60% graduation rate by that spring of 1975. And they wanted to share that. 
And, and 34 students from 48 colleges and universities came to West Lafayette and what was the Society of Black Engineers became the National Society of Black Engineers. Today, we're nearly 24,000 members, over 600 chapters worldwide. We have chapters in the United States, in Western Africa, in Canada, and the Caribbean. And, uh, and we continue to be student governed. Uh, so even though I'm the executive director, I report to a student-based board. In fact, I am a product of the very organization. I served as national chair when I was a, uh, an undergraduate and into my graduate work. And so leadership development is built into our DNA from as early as kindergarten up into the professional ranks as well. Now, as we talked about this and, and Dr. Urbowski kind of mentioned this as well, we are not doing a good job of producing black engineers in this country. In fact, in 2015, we saw that according to the American Society for Engineering Education, only three and a half percent of black uh, of, of degrees awarded, bachelor's degrees awarded in the United States were awarded to African Americans. And even though our mission is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers, we were seeing a declining share of the overall percentage. So we announced this bold, big goal in 2015 to work with colleges and universities to, to nearly triple the number of black engineers they produce annually to 10,000 by 2025. How are we doing in the, in the last five years? We've seen a 45% increase in the number of degrees awarded to African Americans from 3,500 to over 5,000 last year. So that's a 45% increase. That means 1,500 additional black engineers are going into the workforce than, than was the case in five years ago. But we've got a long way to go. One of the ways that we really have to, to work on to get to scale is increasing the, the pathways, as, as Dr. Hrabowski talked about and, and as, 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 as the Congresswoman talked about. We need to increase the pathways and remove obstacles, the systemic obstacles that prevent young people from pursuing engineering. One of the ways we do that is through our SEEK program, the Summer Engineering Experience for Kids. Since 2007, this free three-week program in communities of color around the country, we've held it in over 30 cities around the country, we've reached over 25,000 third to fifth graders. This program provides these young people with an opportunity to not only generate the interest in engineering and build their math competency, I'm gonna come back to that, but build their science or engineering identity as well so they can see themselves as an engineer. If you are not com uh, competent, uh, if you don't have show competency in math in fourth grade, you're unlikely to be uh, to have math competency as high level competency in eighth grade. And if you're not on that path at eighth grade, it's unlikely that someone will tap you on the shoulder and say, you know what, you're good in math, you should become an engineer. Now, just recently with the pandemic, we were able to shift this program to deliver it virtually. So 1,300 third to fifth graders from around the country and literally around the world in three different countries in Nigeria and Canada also were able to download the curriculum, got free tablets from Amazon, thanks to Amazon and, and Honeywell, with downloaded curriculum and participated in the program over a four-week period this year. That position us to not only serve hundreds of young people, but tens of thousands in the future. And then, of course, Judge Frazier talked about the, the uh, fantastic 1990, over 225 chapters worldwide, over 5,000 young people, and they're participating in these year-round programs, much like those that were highlighted just moments ago. But one of the things I love about the program, we provide linkages with collegiate and professional chapters so the young people can, can be what they see. They see the college students, they're inspired by the college students, and they see the pathway to their preference preferable future as well. So what do we need to do? Oh, well, we, we're not just working on the pre-college area and getting generating interest, but we need to make sure young people are getting into college and finish college as well. A few years ago, only 36% of African Americans who started engineering finished in five years. But we know from the research that United Negro College Fund has done is that just $5,000 awarded to an African-American freshman increases the likelihood that he or she will graduate in five years by eight percentage points. 
just $5,000 based on the research that they've done on their scholarship program. So we know, as Dr. Herbosky said, more money, more support is necessary in order to enable these young people to stay engaged in their learning and maximize their academic performance, but also providing support in the corporate realm so that the students cannot just get into the job, but pursue their jobs and thrive and, and work their way up into uh, the C-suite uh, organization. So, so when I talk about this constructing and engineering identity, I'm speaking from personal experience. That's me in the Bronx, in the projects. And that's my father who went to, to, to college at Hampson Institute also, like Dr. Herbowski, but he went for two years, decided to drop out and join the Navy. He never got to pursue his engineering dreams, but he made sure that his sons did as well, two of us earning degrees from MIT in engineering. I had a love for wheels. I had a love for how things operated and, 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 um, and, 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 and rolled as well. He introduced me to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology when I was three years old and to engineering when I was five. Today, I've got two degrees from MIT in engineering. So what we need to do at large and at scale is help young people inspire and, inst and construct STEM ID uh, identities, not just early, but at scale as well, so that more young people like me and others can see themselves as becoming an engineering and then changing the face of engineering worldwide. So thank you so very much for this time. We're, I'm so very grateful that Nesby is a, able to uh, provide uh, input and, and insight into the work that we're doing and invite your audience to join a Nesby Junior chapter, to so start a Nesby Junior chapter and to participate in the SEEK program as well. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Now, you've heard from all of our panelists. I have two general questions that I'd like to ask each panelist to address and then we have some individual questions that have been called in. Uh, let me start by putting out the first question. How are your programs standardized to measure its impact and efficacy for increasing the number of minority students to diversify the STEM pipeline? And two, in which creative ways should we begin to promote the long-term value of traditional and blue STEM careers to our minority populations. So who would like to start, Dr. Robosky? Right, I want people to look at the replication of the Meyerhoff program. People had thought we were successful because there was a black president at the white school or because I was out selling it, but it has to get into the DNA of the institution. You have to have faculty and unfortunately, we don't have so many black faculty. You got to have some white faculty who believe in this and who will help to shape the culture. The, the advantage is that the, the key will be to document what you're doing, to evaluate, evaluate it both uh, when looking at quantitative and qualitative measures. And to, the real question is, are the people graduating? And for us, are they going on to get PhDs? And as I said, we lead the country. Howard is number one. We are number two for PhDs in STEM. Uh, and then we are number one for MD PhDs. But I am honored that the replication has gone now successfully at Chapel Hill, Penn State. Look at the science article on that. I'm especially honored that Howard University, which we all think of as the Mecca in so many ways, has replicated Meyerhoff and started their Bison Scholars some years ago, led by a UMBC graduate. So we've got the proof that we are producing the students, evaluating it, and then working with other institutions to talk about how do you transfer this. And that's what I would say in terms of legislation. Let's find, Congresswoman, the programs around the country, the universities that are making a difference in the numbers. And let's talk about, we suggest in our articles, double that number. If we doubled the number of Blacks who are going on to get PhDs coming out of the top 30 institutions, many HBCUs, some predominantly white institutions, we would literally increase the number of national PhDs per year by a third, by over 30%, just by doubling the, the, the top 30 institutions. So the idea of focusing on those who are doing well to make them better while replicating it with other places can make a big difference. Congressman, Johnson. Congressman yes. Johnson, let me talk about the blue collar STEM piece because that's okay. something that we round, what we call the skilled technical workers. Yes. Um, going back and resonating off of uh, Dr. Reed, my mother joined the army uh, in the late 40s and 50s. 
and she became a reg she became a registered nurse. She did not have a bachelor's degree, but she was a, a, a full-fledged nurse in the army, came out, did very well, had to eventually get her bachelor's degree because that's the way they discriminated against black nurses when they came out of the military. But as we go now, and as you know, I led this report for the National Science Board for the past two years, we came out a report on the skilled technical workforce. And these are those folks who have post high school, but do not have a bachelor's degree, but have certificates and or AA degrees, and they have STEM capable skills, and it offers another pathway to the middle class, particularly for black and brown folks. You can go out right now and you can get some of these skills. And I think if we put more emphasis in that, as for example, right now, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics is now looking at the skilled technical workforce. Also, we have to look at better partnerships. I would say, for example, at the University of District of Columbia, we're one of the few universities that has a law school, a graduate school in engineering, a four-year school, but we also have a community college, which also workforce development, which offers those pathways. We have an aerospace mechanics program right now where I can take a young woman or a young man out of high school who has no mechanical aptitude and they can get a two-year FAA certificate because we were located right at National Airport and they can walk right across to Southwest and get a job at $70,000 a year. And then guess what happens? Maybe in a couple of years, someone goes to them and says, hey, maybe I, you can get your mechanical engineering degree. So they could come either to UDC or UMBC or they could go to Howard, okay? And then maybe after a couple of years, they go get their degree in program management. So now we can construct these careers. And if you think about it, the National Academies has said by 2022, there are almost 4 million jobs that are not being filled. And when we went to Detroit, when we talked to the electrical engineering union, those skills, these electricians, these auto workers are not your daddy's or mom's auto workers. They have to know coding, they have to know thermal imaging. They have to know four-year transfers, but they don't need a four-year degree. And so for students who may not right now be ready for a four-year degree or may not have access, either financial or otherwise, going in these areas are very, very good. And it's very important right now we have the Council for the Nat Wor National Worker, American Worker, where we're looking for those folks. And in terms of legislation, we need to be putting more money in the ATE program, Advanced Technological Educational Program at NSF, which funds two-year colleges and encourages these people to go after these degrees so that they can start being part of the STEM-capable workforce. Thank you very much. Let me just say that here in Dallas at the Community College District, uh, Cedar Valley College, with Dr. Seabrooks as the president, I work with and he's beginning to call these blue collar STEM degrees, uh, not blue collar, gold collar, because they're making more than most people with a bachelor's degree because right. of those skills. Dr. Robosky wanted to make a comment. Sure, I think in terms of legislation, and I, I really support community colleges, since uh, almost 40 some percent of all of our students starting community colleges of all races. But I think the idea of encouraging partnerships between community colleges, universities, companies, and government agencies. We work very closely with the National Security Agency, one of the largest feeder to NSA. We've got about 1,200 graduates there, and that's of all races. But the key is that they also have an interest in working with our training programs. We have training programs at the university in a company and are producing thousands of veterans and others who have training in cybersecurity to work around the world. So we've got to rethink it, but we also need to educate the public about the possibilities. We don't want to take away from the four year or going on to get a PhD, but there are for a lot of people, these are wonderful opportunities here. And so we got to change attitudes about that and have incentives for people. Northrop Grumman is working with us all the way from middle school with a STEAM center that focuses on families. And this is all in the black community in Baltimore, all the way up, but also looking at skills that we can develop a different way. So incentivizing companies and, and agencies to work with universities and community colleges. Thank you very much. Uh, let me go to the in, some individual questions that have come in. First to Dr. Reed, what can parents do to prepare their children or careers in STEM? And how do you, what do we do to scale to the widening of the pipeline for black children to pursue 
STEM careers. Your, your motive. Yeah. And I apologize, my power is about to run out. So okay. I'll just say building self-efficacy, confidence uh, that the young people can pursue and seeking out opportunities, even online, for them to really build their competence in math. Uh, not to be afraid of math, but to, to embrace it and embrace their hills. That's a key factor, uh, much like I did. We weren't, a, we weren't allowed to say we couldn't do math in our household. And so making sure that that's key uh, in, in terms of their self-efficacy is key to them uh, being on the pathway to success. Thank you very much. I'll go back to Dr. Roboski. Yeah, I, I, I'm so old. I have two books that I wrote 25 years ago on raising smart black children and everything in those books will still be true. One is called Beating the Odds on Raising Smart Black Boys. One is Overcoming the Odds on Raising Smart Black Girls. The cover of the girl's book is green, by the way, uh, Dr. Frazier, the, uh, somehow it's, it's very interesting that when you look at it, you will see this. That idea that Dr. Uh, Reed mentioned about self, sense of self, building that sense of self, very important. But in the spirit of what our other our panelists have said, my mama was, a, was an English teacher and then became a math teacher. And what she learned was this. Give me a child who can read well, and I can teach her to solve word problems. And this is what my books talk about. Anybody who's in engineering, in chemistry, and physics knows you can't solve a word problem if you can't read. So while I am a mathematician and get goosebumps doing math, I want that child to know how to read well and think critically from an early age, because then they don't know how to solve those word problems, in addition to all the wonderful things people are talking about. Look at the UMBC Lakeland partnership with Northrop Grumman, because it's focused on reading and math, but also on having black engineers come into the school and working with families to teach them what they need to do. Thank you. Another question we just received. The national conversation lately has been about the U.S. facing fierce global competition in science and engineering and that the talent is the difference in the matter. Uh, this is to Dr. McCrary. In your role as a National Science Board or National Science Board, what is the National Science Board doing to address the challenge of growing diversity as well as domestic STEM talent? Uh, thank you, Congressman Johnson. The National Science Board over the past two years set a course for what would be the vision for research for the country for the next decade. And that came out in May titled Vision 2030. And we have four areas that we're looking at but two that we're really concentrating on because if you look from 2000 to 2017, our share, for example, of R&D global has dropped almost 12%. And in fact, other countries are, are leading the way. And so when we did this vision, we looked expanding the ecosystem. The number one thing that is extremely important is the development of diverse domestic STEM talent. And so one of the first things that we're doing right now is we are working with the director of the National Science Foundation, talking about, and he's, and he's new, talking about how do we develop domestic and diverse STEM talent. We came out with a statement three weeks ago on uh, Blacks and what's happening in terms of systemic racism in science and engineering. We held two weeks ago at our national meeting for the first time, we went and reviewed what NSF is doing and how they're funding of the HBCU accounts. And at the same time, had a panel that talked about the black experience in science and engineering. And so what the science board realizes is also it's a matter of national security because for many of the technologies we're talking about, the industries of the future, quantum, AI, biotechnology, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, Many of these things are what we call dual use. They have military use. And so in HBCUs, they have a higher proportion of students who are US citizens. These students can go right on right now and work, for example, in the Department of Defense, and they can get clearances. And so right now, we're pushing that, uh, the National Science Board. We're going to start this engagement as one of the pipelines to get our HBCUs up there. Uh, and in fact, in the 2017 legislation that came out, the National Science Board talked about the need for the security of the United States and its importance. Because if you think about the National Science Foundation, its mission has not changed since Vannevar Bush in 1947. And that is fundamental research, economic development, national security. And this is the role that HBCUs play. 
Thank you very much. We will be making sure that we stay close to you and making sure that we can implement uh, some of your goals into legislation. Uh, Judge uh, Frazier, the links have done a wonderful job in establishing the Nesbitt Junior Chapters for Students. Are many of your members STEM professionals uh, in links? If not, how easy is it for persons who are not STEM professionals to establish and run the NSBE chapters? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Johnson. Uh, many of our members are not STEM professionals. Uh, we are a lot of educators, um, a number of professions that are covered, but I would say like most of society um, and including in black women, we are disproportionately represented in STEM. And so we, even within the links, uh, we are low numbers of STEM. Most of our Nesby Junior chapters, um, the advisors from the links are not STEM professionals. We certainly do have some that are engineers and scientists and have taken the lead. Uh, but in many of our chapters, they're educators, they're just people that are hardworking. And what I would say to um, both parents as well as other groups, you know, we let the fear of science and math scare us off, or we say we aren't good at it, or we never were good at it, or we didn't have an affinity for it. Um, if you remember um, the chart that I showed about the demographics of our chapters, a lot of them are for third to fifth graders. I think about over 50%. Um, I know everybody on this call can and listening in can do math and science um, well above that. And so we need to, as Dr. Reed talked about, getting a firm foundation by fourth grade for our students. Um, this is where it's about exposure. And even if we're not a STEM professional, we all know a doctor, a dentist, um, somebody who is doing some form of STEM. And you know, it's really making sure our kids see and experience. And when you talk about um, you know, what you can do to, as parents. Um, my husband and I were engineering majors like uh, Dr. Rabowski, we met in college and, um, but we raised our kids to be STEM professionals and our daughter now is a software engineer, our son and his wife are engineers, but our daughter often laughs and says to us, you, you tricked us into being STEM. Well, no, I made sure they had STEM toys. Um, so they didn't just have video games, they had video games that required them to solve a puzzle before they could move on to the next step. And so there are, um, in the library, um, they often have STEM books or STEM toys you can check out in uh, a lot of the bookstores. Um, there's free sciencebuddies.com that people can pick up and they give you all the instruction guides on how to do STEM programming. So I say, you know, you don't have to be a STEM professional then anybody with a passion and an interest can do this and get our kids engaged. Thank you very much. Now, here's another question. I get it all the time. Uh, is it more valuable to go to a community college and get a skill than to get some degrees at a bachelor's degree level or a lot of loans from getting that bachelor's degree and can't find a job? Let me answer that, um, because what we're seeing from the National Center of Science and Engineering Statistics, it all depends on the student's uh, situation. And I will quote something when we were talking to depart uh, officials from the Department of Labor. They said, if you walk, particularly in an urban classroom, and you had 100 students and said, how many of you imagine yourself seeing to go to college? You'd only get two students who'd raise their hand up. Okay, now these are senior assistant secretaries at the Department of Labor. But when we but they said, if you say, how many of you CCU going to a four-year college, going to a two-year college, going to a trade school, going into the military, you'll get about 98% of those kids raising their hands. And so to what Dr. Hebrowski uh, had said earlier, we really need to have a broadened conversation at that level with our students about the possibility. When we went out and talked to a number of students, a number of them had gone to college for the first year, and then realized, you know, this is not for me. They found another profession through a community college that they really enjoyed, but of course they had to walk around with one year of debt. We have to really make sure, because we talked to the Association of High School Counselors, that counselors really know about the broad breadth. And that's going to take cabinet agencies talking to one another and then getting out public service announcements where you see folks with hard hats. I mean, there are petroleum operators when we were down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they're paying $100,000 a year. 
You don't need a four year degree, okay? You can start as an auto worker in Detroit. We were there at Macomb Community College. You start at $75,000 a year. But I think what we also have to do is show that there are these partnerships. It's not one and done go to college or one and done going to community college. So for example, NSF funds a partnership right now with the, uh, with the Florence Darlington Community College and Clemson University, which is an R1 university, they are working on materials and they're working with Boeing because they want to become an aerospace center. They're working on aerospace materials, but they also realize once these materials become commercializable, someone's got to be able to machine them. And we want to be ready to have that. So they work together as partners. And so the community college is coming up with new ways to do additive manufacturing and laser tooling of these materials. The scientists are listening to those folks at Clemson in terms of working materials. And then Boeing is coming in and adding the cost dimension and saying, well, look, these great materials are nice. They help us with lift and thrust, but we only can afford this cost. I think if you can bring that triumvirate way uh, of folks together, then you have all sorts of careers. And then a student in high school can see that palette and say, hey, I might do this for two years, get a certificate. I can then go on for four years. And by the way, somebody else will pay for it, all right? Or for example, I can get that through the military, give them five years, like my son, he's in the, he, he just graduated from the Coast Guard Academy. He's a communications expert. Okay, he gives them five years. And by the way, they're coming to him right now and saying, hey, look, how would you like to go get your master's degree and we'll pay for it. Information and communication is very, very powerful. And that's where organizations like Nesby and the Lynx and Novache working at these levels get to these parents and tell them. Because for many of these parents still in 2020, for their kids going into STEM, this might be the first generation. But they don't have to be STEM experts. They just have to know what are the options. And when you have options, you have a good life. Dr. Roboski. Dr. McCrary is so, so right. I, I want to ask you, Congresswoman, to think about legislation that will encourage community groups, uh, universities, community colleges, and government agencies to work on exposure for the public, exposure. Two thirds of American families have never had anybody go to college. And you look at the African American population and they're larger, the percentage is even larger. And they don't know about these things. I do know, and I'm gonna say it publicly, that there's a lot of money that goes for very expensive for-profit institutions. We have not been able to look at how we help people understand what their options are and how it's a continuum that you can start at one level getting skills and keep on moving on through that. But I do think having community groups and higher education institutions working to help families understand the options will be very important and working with the K through 12 system. Yes, Dr. McCrary. Let me just dovetail on what uh, Dr. Obrowski also said. Here's something I think also you can do and you can do this to all your members, to all the states. And I'm talking about the public institutions. The public institutions were set up to be economic anchors in their communities, okay? But every public institution across the states for the past 10 years have seen a decline in terms of state revenues and funding to those institutions. We need to say this is a Sputnik II moment we're at at our country right now, okay? And I'm old enough because I remember Sputnik, all right? And that we need those state houses as well as the federal government to put more money into these public institutions so that then, because they are anchors in the community, they can reach out to the high schools. They can reach out to the local businesses. They can bring those students in and they don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul in order to meet their operating expenses because they can then reach out to the community. UDC, for example, is the open, only urban land grant university HBCU in the country. We serve the district in all eight wards, okay? Um, yet, we only get 2% of the uh, GDP from the city. We've got to talk to legislators and your colleagues across that the public universities, the UMBC, the Universities of Maryland, the University of Virginia, okay, the University of Texas, those public institutions are important and we've got to get back to this again. And again, it may not be a satellite over top that the Russians flew that we saw back in the late 50s, but this is a Sputnik II moment in terms of the industries of the future and the challenge and preeminence for global competitiveness. Thank you very much. Dr. Reed, 
what can parents do now to prepare children for careers in STEM? How, how do they approach them? Many of them are not STEM. Yeah, and I think that's, that's, um, that's important. And my, neither of my parents were STEM. Um, my mother never went to college. And um, my father, as I mentioned, went two years and then dropped out and joined the Navy. Um, and he had a, though he had a STEM mindset, but, uh, but not there. Um, one of the things that I, I think that parents should do is it really leverage the, 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 the interests of the young people, right? Their, their, their child. So one of the things that I, I noticed that there are four of us, my three siblings and me, and each of us have different skill, um, different interest and my father though he never finished college had this knack identify the thing that really interests us most and help us uh, form that we didn't have a lot of money you know our, our utilities were cut off um i had to build my own bicycles growing up as a kid um but one of the things he did with these i love trains so every chance he got we wouldn't be able to ride the train talk about this my Younger brother, who's an executive with BET, loved filming, and 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 so he got a cheap camera and started to film as well. And now he's the creative director for the Black Entertainment Television BET. So the the idea of 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 leveraging the interests and and really expanding that, using that as a catalyst, is key for young people so that they can have success. One of the research findings that I've discovered is that a student who is most successful in college have high degree of what is called that they're going to be successful. There are multiple sources of self-efficacy. One is mastery experiences. The more success you have, the more success you expect to have. The other is vicarious experiences. Seeing someone with whom you could relate have success gives you confidence that you could be successful. And that's why sort of it's important for role models for, for young people to see role models. But the third is really key. I call it the Home Depot effect. Home Depot used to have a, a phrase that says, you can do it, we can help. That idea that I can do it, I can be successful, from a trusted source gives me confidence that I could be successful. So those three roles that parents can play, giving those students mastery experiences, role models, as well as mentoring and hearing, hearing affirmation are key uh, for success as well. I, 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 I want to call on Dr. Bosque to do our wrap up statement. I, I certainly agree with everything you've said, everybody um, about ways of helping children um, the majority of our children, black children, are not coming up to math and reading proficiency by middle school. If we look at any of our cities and rural areas, th this is where we, we think about that. And that means, and that's about needing to give school systems more support with the teachers and with children and with, with parents and with families. Here's what I would say. Uh, I heard Dr. McCurry mention the Sputnik moment. Before when that happened, Congress came up with all these math and science programs around the country. We need many more math and science camps because for a lot of parents, unfortunately, they don't have the wherewithal to know where to go to get the mentor or the other people that we've got to give them support. Those black families, so many of them need support uh, so they can say, this is where I can take my child and give her that experience when she's in the third grade or whatever. So we need a lot of math and science camps uh, for the summer and in the evening times that could fit in with, with Nesby and, and give funding to community groups and universities and others to get these children involved. Because the one point in, in that, that, that everybody has said is, we've got to develop a sense of self in children. And what I say in my TED talk, you got to build community. People do better when they're working with other people, whether it's on a basketball team or a robotics team or whatever, we got to get children working in groups to solve problems and to dream. Last point, uh, the lead scientists right now with the COVID vaccine. Dr. Kismikia Corbett, little black girl from North Carolina, now strong black woman, is a Myhoff scholar, is one of ours. And we are so proud of her as she is leading that team. And then, and the lead neuroscientist in the world for young investigators is another one at Duke University, Dr. Zarasa. So the vision of the lead neuroscientist and the lead COVID vaccine, that's what black children can do. Thank you.
Thank you very much. You have been outstanding. I'm so grateful to you. And I'm going to be calling on each one of you for input that I can use perhaps to make sure that we're headed in the right direction legislatively. Uh, Judge Frazier, I'm grateful to you, indebted to you for spending your time when you could be on a beach, spending all this time with all these link chapters all over the country, <laughs> trying to make sure that our young people get this basic information. It's really the future of our nation. We have contributed all along and now we're gonna do this now, but it cannot happen without this kind of stimulation. I'm grateful to all of you. And thank you so very much for appearing. And of course, I'll be calling on you later. And thanks to the audience. We are grateful to the ALC and thank you to the foundation and all of our sponsors. Thank you for your leadership. It's a pleasure. Keep hope thank alive. You. Keep hope alive. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. What kind of a company do I want to work for? A company that's always kind of trying to change the status quo. If you have a good idea, you can actually get it done. That treats their employees as they would their best friend. Like human beings. To have a bigger impact than just what's in it for them. That is safe for me and for my community. Giving back to the community, that's what it's all about. I want a rainbow of ages, of genders, of colors, of ideas. I want to work for a company where I know that I matter.